Good evening. Welcome to Thai PBS English News Service. I'm Super John Clint Suan. Deputy Prime Minister General Yuta Saksasiva Pao was in the Deep South today to boost soldiers' morale and order them to proceed with extra caution during the last 10 days of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. Meanwhile, Deputy Prime Minister Shalom Yumabrun called an urgent meeting today following intelligence of planned attacks in the Deep South. Deputy Prime Minister Shalom Yubamrung, one of the three key men who Prime Minister Ying Lakshinawat has put in charge of solving Southern unrest, called for a video conference with the police and Southern security units following reports of more possible attacks in the region. Not much information was offered by authorities except that the intelligence agencies report the planning of future attacks involves a number of stolen cars, which analysts say may be used as car bombs. Deputy PM Yuta Saksasivapa, who was in Patani, says soldiers and security units in the south have been ordered to be extremely alert during the last 10 days of Ramadan, which ends on August 19th. During this period, experts in the south anticipate more attacks as insurgents try to elevate the unrest to an international level. The government is now considering offering amnesty to some insurgents who turn themselves in. However, those who have committed criminal offenses may still have to go on trial. The government's latest initiative to set up a unit to solve the southern unrest using a holistic approach known in Thai as Ga Pa Ta will use their majesties the king and queen's approach in solving the southern unrest. And Nawanakon Industrial Park is confident that its flood walls will protect it against this year's flood. The prime minister is also confident that Thailand can handle the water situation. Prime Minister Ying Lakshinawatch says that she is confident that the government's flood prevention measures, both upstream and downstream, will protect Thailand from falling victim to a repeat of last year's massive flooding. She insists Thailand's industrial zones in the central region will not suffer thanks to His Majesty's Royal Dyke Initiatives, which will help drain the water into the sea. Nipit Arunwong Nayutia, MD of the Nawanakon Industrial Park, one of the seven major industrial parks inundated last year, says his 5.5 meter tall, 20 kilometer long flood wall will definitely protect all factories in the zone. The construction project is now 92% complete. 186 factories in Nawanakon are back up and running in full capacity. 18 are still in the renovation process and 20 have closed their businesses down after the site was underwater for months late last year. However, Nipit says four new factories have moved in and seven have expanded. This, according to Nawanakon Executive, reflects on how investors, Thai and foreign, are confident of Thailand's flood protection systems. An academic in Chiang Mai University suggests the earth tremor measuring 3.1 on the Richter scale felt in Uttaradit province this morning was unusual despite the minor size because the quake was nowhere near the main fault line. Local residents felt the ground shake when a quake with a magnitude of 3.1 hit the district of Man Kok at 8 a.m. this morning. The epic center was 13 kilometers underground. According to Uttaradit Governor Shalom Chai Phuong Khon, there was no reports of damage, especially at the Sirikit Dam, which is 66 kilometers away. A mineral resources officer based in Lampam Province says the quake in Uttaradit was caused by a slide of the Nan Uttaradit Fault, which stretches from Nan to Uttaradit Province. However, Associate Professor Sampan Singha Warachwala, Dean of the Faculty of Science at Chiang Mai University, suggests the quake is not normal as he claims the shake was not on the Uttaradit fault line. He suggests scientists and authorities should keep a close eye on this from now on. The quake was the largest this year in the area. A 2.8 tremor struck on January 31st in Chiang Rai's Teung District and a second on April the 5th in Chiang Rai's Muang District. Demonstrators protesting against the U.S. decisions to grant fugitive former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat a U.S. visa gathered at the American Embassy today, demanding Thaksin's visa be revoked. Around 200 anti-Thaksin demonstrators gathered in front of the U.S. Embassy on wireless load, demanding the U.S. revoke ousted former PM Thaksin Shinawat's visa. Thaksin arrived in New York on Monday on a private trip. The fugitive ex-premier will also travel on up to other states during his one-week stay in America. Thaksin fled into exile in August 2008 to evade a two-year jail term for a conflict of interest case bought by graft busters appointed by the coup leadership that toppled him in 2006. 
The demonstrators also urged the U.S. to extradite him to Thailand. There were no reports of an immediate response from the U.S. Embassy to the protesters' demands. Mong Kwon Rit, Suk Sin Taranon, Secretary of the Na Nation Associate Anti-Corruption Network, says protesters will return in 15 days to find out what the progress has been made in the revocation of Taksin's visa. Taksin's last visit to the U.S. was in September 2006 when, while he was attending a U.N. meeting in New York, a military coup toppled him from power. The massive influx of rice into the government's pledging scheme this year is causing one to two days delay in storage availability. Some millers are demanding the government solve the problem as a matter of urgency. Meanwhile, related agencies continue to closely monitor the warehousing process to prevent corruption. Today, the committee monitoring the government's rice pledging scheme inspected the C. Ponkit Inter Rice Central Warehouse. The committee's members include representatives from the state agencies, such as the Public Warehouse Organization and the Bank for Agriculture and Agricultural Cooperatives. Deputy Governor of Nontaburi Province noted that the inspection is part of a monthly effort to monitor the problem of corruption and to check the size of the rice stockpile as well as the quality. Many millers, such as those in Sainoi District, are complaining that there has been a delay at the central warehouse's ability to restore the massive amount of pledged rice being delivered to them. This has subsequently caused a delay in using the Bai Pratuan documents, which the farmers must present at a bank to get cash for their rice under the pledging scheme. Millers are asking the government to resolve the problem quickly. The state rice pledging scheme has now stockpiled as much as 17 million tons of unmilled rice, which is the largest government rice stock in history. This means that the amount of rice exceeds the storage capacity at the central warehouses. The Commerce Ministry has plans to release the, the rice in small lots later this month. And while one of the major goals for the ASEAN Economic Community, or AEC, is to enable free trade by eliminating custom duties, member countries have instead turned to imposing non-tariff barriers to protect their local industries. The question is, how can ASEAN prevent protectionism from obstructing the goals from a free trade zone? Here's more from Kun Bandit Gerbandit. Two ASEAN countries currently imposing non-tariff measures are Indonesia and the Philippines as they try to protect sensitive indigenous industries like rice, red onions and fruit production. Thailand itself limits the times when corn for animal feed can be imported. Such protectionism is posing a significant challenge to the true integration of ASEAN's member economies in 2015. Thai rice exports will be directly affected by non-tariff measures. The Philippines, on the one hand, has formally requested the World Trade Organization, or WTO, to extend its rice import quota for another five years. On the other hand, Indonesia has banned the sale of Thai frequent rice in supermarkets, and the local administration in Depok, south of Jakarta, has even declared Tuesdays no rice days to reduce rice imports while the local rice sector catches up to meet demand. Furthermore, Indonesia has prohibited many Thai agricultural products, except some rice and durian fruit, from being imported through the port of Jakarta, sending them to remote seaports like Surabaya instead. The majority of consumers are in Jakarta, so now Thai vegetable and fruit exporters have to transport their goods 800 kilometers from Surabaya to the capital. Transportation often takes several days, incurring cost and delay. Non-tariff measures take eight basic forms. The two most widely used are sanitary and phytosanitary and technical barriers to trade. Countries that enforce these regulations claim to be protecting the health and safety of their citizens. Singapore and Malaysia also impose the same non-tariff measures. Protectionism by ASEAN countries intensifies as each country writes its own rules, setting ever higher benchmarks to block imports from countries that fail to meet these sometimes arbitrary standards. If each country sets import standards unilaterally, disparity is bound to occur. But ASEAN governments can take the lead by listening to the opinions of the private sector discussing them and then constructing a single set of standards for the region. This will benefit every member state. 
Even though ASEAN has been talking about establishing regional standards for quite some time, no conclusion has been reached. So businesses in ASEAN have formed their own groups to try to mitigate the adverse effects of non-tariff measures. The Thai Frozen Foods Association, for instance, has formed alliances with associations in neighboring countries. If any country shows signs of imposing unfair trade measures, exporters from across the region address the issue together through an ASEAN Seafood Federation. Even though ASEAN is attempting to create a free trade environment, non-tariff measures continue to hamper that effort. Still, experts suggest that the goal is achievable if ASEAN commits itself to a common set of trade standards. This will result in increased competitiveness and will improve the living standards of ASEAN citizens as they enjoy better quality and wider range of products. Thank you, Kudbandit. And Gao Pongbriyun, Thailand's light flyweight boxer, has advanced to the event's final round in the Olympics. He may be the first and only Thai athlete to come home from London with a gold medal. Gao Pumbriyun of the Thai boxing squad in London passed the semi-finals as he beat third seed David Aryapetan of Russia with a close score of 13 to 12. Millions of Thais were sharing Gao on, of course, including his family in Kampang Pet province, as he is the country's only remaining gold medal hopeful. Mali Pumbriyun, Gao's mother, is confident her son will come home as the golden boy. Until now, Thailand has won two medals at the Olympics, one silver in weightlifting and one bronze in taekwondo. Gao Pongbuyun will now fight for the gold against his Chinese opponent tomorrow. And as Thailand celebrates Mother's Day this weekend, a British mother has traveled to Thailand to seek justice of her late daughter who was murdered in Chiang Mai 12 years ago. Susan Jones mother of Kirsty Jones, a Welsh tourist who was murdered in Chiang Mai in 2000, is back in Thailand offering a 10,000 pound or 491,000 baht reward for new information about her daughter's death. Kirsty, the 23-year-old British backpacker, was raped and strangled at a guest house in Chiang Mai 12 years ago. In an emotional statement read at a news conference in Bangkok, Susan Jones expressed gratitude to the police authorities here who have been working on her daughter's case. With the passing of time, people's loyalties change and relationships end, which may remove any previous reluctance to come forward. Something small, which may seem irrelevant at the time, could now be significant and add new pieces to the jigsaw which the police already have. I am convinced there is someone who has information that could lead to the arrest of, of the person who took my daughter's life away. Detective Superintendent Andrew John from the Diffid Powys Police Authority in Wales said that forensic evidence collected from the crime scene points towards an Asian male suspect. John said he hopes the appeal will bring new information to light. I believe this crime is detectable. And we will continue to support and liaise with Colonel Song Sak and his team. Some 200 posters showing Kirsty's picture are to be circulated throughout Chiang Mai in the hope of uncovering new information on the murder case. Hugh Adams, Thai PBS. Thank you, and Hugh. And Thai PBS English News Service is offering a job position for an English-speaking news reporter. If you are interested, please send your CV to job at thaipbs.or.th. Or for more information, please do visit our website, www.thaipbs.or.th. Please enjoy your long holiday. I'm Super John Clint Swan saying good night for now. Swadikap.